Seeing my granddaughter Mary not touching her hamburger, the server approached us with a stern tone. You need to eat what you've ordered, or it'll be a problem. Would you normally say that to a customer? Arguing seemed futile, so I responded humbly. I'm sorry. I think she's just waiting for mine to arrive. After my apologetic reply, the server walked away, looking dissatisfied. What a rude attitude. Trying to lighten the mood, I turned to Mary. Let's eat, shall we? But Mary remained downcast. What's wrong? Something seemed off. Then, the same server came back to our table, carrying something. Here's the toy that comes with the kid's meal. She slammed the toy onto the table. Looking up at the server, I saw her smirking at Mary. It was a chilling sight. Mary must have felt something was wrong too. I don't want this. She threw the toy on the table to the floor. She's never usually so rough. Now, now. We shouldn't throw things. As I tried to calm Mary and pick up the toy she had thrown. Suddenly. Grandma, let's get out of here. Mary grabbed my arm as I was reaching for the toy and shouted. Looking at the discarded toy, I noticed a piece of paper. With something written on it. Grandma! No! Ignoring Mary's plea, I looked at the folded paper and felt a chill. It was a Saturday. I was on my way to my son Jim's house. It was a warm day, hinting that spring was near. Then, Mom, thanks for today as well. As soon as I arrived, Jim and his wife Kate left the house together. For their once or twice a month Saturday work. Grandma, what's for lunch today? After seeing her parents off, Mary came to me with a lovely smile. How about we go out to eat today? Mary was delighted with my suggestion. My name is Ellie. I am 63 years old this year. When my son and his wife are busy, I come to look after Mary like this. Having lost my husband early and spent a lot of time alone, the time spent with my granddaughter was nothing short of happiness for me. My son Jim has always tried hard not to be a burden on me. Even though there's no need for him to worry about me, he's been working ever since he graduated from high school. Thinking back, his first job was terrible. It was then I truly understood what a black company was, even as a parent. He would leave for work early in the morning and return home around the time the date changed. You could visibly see him getting thinner, even though he was quite well built, as he continued with that lifestyle. Seeing my son Jim become increasingly distressed, I somehow managed to convince him and finally, he decided to quit that job. It had been three years since he started working there. Though there seemed to be some issues with the company upon leaving, I felt relieved once he was free from that place. I'm going to be unemployed for a while. Jim said this with a look of regret, but seeing my child physically and mentally deteriorating was much harder for me. When I told him that, I'll take my time to think and decide on the next place. He smiled, seemingly reassured. Being a hard worker, he continued his job search while studying for a qualification in a field he was interested in, and finally, he found a new job. I was worried because of the first experience, but the new workplace turned out to be surprisingly clean. He would come home on time, and there was no unpaid overtime. Jim seemed to have some peace of mind and was lively and enthusiastic about going to work every day. When he started to be recognized for his abilities and got on a career track. There's something important I want to talk about. He said suddenly with a serious look. I'm sensitive to these things. He must want to introduce a girlfriend. Something important? I feigned ignorance and asked. There's someone I want you to meet, mom. My intuition was right. Jim had dated a few women before. I wasn't explicitly told, but you can somehow tell. But this was the first time he wanted to introduce someone to me. 
So, that means? I'm free whenever, so let me know when you've decided on a day to bring her over. I said casually, feeling a mix of happiness and sadness. Later, the woman Jim brought over was polite and greeted properly. I've always taught Jim to greet properly since he was young. So, the first impression was perfect. I didn't intend to judge, but I couldn't help noticing her appearance and behavior. Nice to meet you, I'm Kate. She seemed nervous, her small frame tense. Nice to meet you too, I'm Jim's mom. Wondering if I'd been staring too much, I greeted her brightly to ease the tension. Jim, why don't you two sit in the living room and wait? While they waited in the living room, I prepared some coffee. Before bringing it over, they were whispering to each other but quieted down when they saw me. As I served the coffee, I heard them say thank you. But then, there was silence for a while. How do mothers around the world liven up moments like these? It's my first time, and I'm just puzzled. Huh? But it's everyone's first time in these situations, isn't it? Realizing something so obvious made me laugh unexpectedly. Jim and Kate looked at me, puzzled. I'm sorry. It's just that it's the first time Jim's brought a girlfriend over, so I'm a bit nervous. I decided to just be myself from now on. After all, we're going to be a family for a long time. I'm nervous too. But today, we have something we want to tell you, Mom. Here it comes. This is the moment to listen seriously. Mom, we're thinking of getting married. I thought so. We've already got the okay from Kate's parents, but... Jim stops mid-sentence, looking surprised. Next to him, Kate also seems flustered. What are they both so flustered about? Mom. They peek at my face, worried. Wondering what was happening, I felt something cold spill onto my hand on my lap. Eh. It took me a moment to realize, but it seems tears were falling from my eyes. I'm so sorry. Did I do something wrong? It's the first meeting, and here the mother of the person they want to marry is suddenly crying. Kate's panicked reaction is now a funny story, but at that moment, she must have been really anxious. Oh, why is this happening? I'm not even sure myself. Saying that, I laughed through my tears. I had no intention of opposing Jim's marriage. In fact, I was happy that he had finally found someone to be happy with other than me. These tears must be of happiness. But I couldn't deny feeling like a part of my heart was being taken away. After excusing myself for a moment and coming back, they still looked worried. With a deliberately cheerful voice, I said, Kate, I trust Jim. If he chose you, I know everything will be okay no matter what. Kate seemed to be waiting for what I would say next. Promise me, both of you, to build a happy family together. I could see Kate's expression brighten. Thank you, Mom. All right, no more serious talk. With that, I started asking about how they got to know each other and their journey to deciding on marriage. While Jim was seeing Kate out, I muttered to my husband's portrait. Jim is getting married. Time flies, doesn't it? It felt as if the portrait of my husband smiled back. Kate works at the same place as Jim, and she plans to continue working even after getting married. Jim wanted to live together, but I declined. I didn't want to intrude on the young couple, and I was looking forward to having time to myself neither wanting to be a burden nor to burden them. They decided on a new home within cycling distance from our house, and Jim moved out. Time flew by, and soon my granddaughter Mary was born. I was amazed at how adorable a creature a grandchild could be. As Kate's maternity leave was coming to an end, I checked with Jim. Have you decided who will look after Mary? I was hoping for a chance to take care of Mary not out of kindness or obligation, but because I wanted to be with her. 
However, Jim thought I was worried and gave me a disappointing reply. Mom, don't worry. Our company has a daycare. Jim's new job really seemed to be a respectable white-collar company. I guess I won't be taking care of her. A few days later, Kate, who had been observing our conversation, brought me hope. Ellie, are you free this Saturday? She asked over the phone, and since I had no particular plans, I inquired about the matter. Actually, both Jim and I have sudden work on Saturday. And the daycare is closed on Saturdays. I immediately responded. Mary? You mean, if I could take care of Mary? I was leaning forward even though I was on the phone. Could you? I almost answered too eagerly, but kept my composure. Yes, that's fine. My voice must have trembled with excitement. Kate sounded happy on the other end of the phone. Since then, I occasionally take care of Mary, which has continued to this day. As it approached noon, I took Mary out. As promised, we walked to the nearby family restaurant. I would prefer to eat at home but after receiving suspicious calls and an unexpected pizza delivery while taking care of Mary at Jim's house, I felt uneasy. The family restaurant we were heading to was where I had worked part-time before, familiar and convenient for us. Upon arrival, the staff guided us to the usual spacious sofa seat. It was Saturday lunchtime, but it wasn't too crowded. Mary, what would you like to eat today? I handed her the menu while sitting next to her. I want the kids' menu. Mary opened the menu to the kids' menu page. I'll have this. She pointed to her usual choice, a hamburger. Mary really loves hamburgers, doesn't she? Seeing Mary's smiling face, I chose my own meal. Although spring was near, the days were still a bit chilly. I decided on the seasonal pot au feu. After placing our order via the touch panel, we went to the drink bar. Mary chose orange juice, and I filled a cup with coffee, then we returned to our seats. Did Grandma know I like hamburgers? Of course! It was a casual conversation, but my face was smiling the whole time. Right, Mary. Go to the bathroom before we eat. Mary often wants to go to the bathroom during meals, so I encouraged her to go ahead. Okay. With a lively response, Mary headed to the bathroom. Her steps seemed lighter, perhaps excited for the hamburger. Her retreating figure was endearing to me. When Mary returned, the hamburger was served. But she didn't start eating. Maybe she was waiting for my meal to arrive. Mary, you can start eating. I encouraged, but Mary looked at me puzzled. That's when the server brought my pot au feu. Noticing Mary hadn't touched her burger, the server spoke in a stern tone. You need to eat what you've ordered. Would you normally say that to a customer? Surprised, I thought about the food waste issue and wondered if staff were instructed to say this. Arguing seemed pointless, so I responded humbly. I'm sorry. She's just waiting for mine. We'll make sure it's eaten. The server left with a look of dissatisfaction. She was strikingly beautiful but had such a poor attitude. Shaking off my astonishment, I encouraged Mary. Let's eat. However, Mary remained downcast and didn't touch her hamburger. What's wrong, Mary? Something seemed off. Then the same server approached with something in hand. Here's the toy that comes with the kid's meal. She said bluntly, placing the toy on the table. Something was wrong. I boldly looked at the server, who was smirking at Mary. It wasn't a kind smile, but something creepy, as if plotting. Feeling a chill, Mary must have sensed something too. I don't want this. She threw the toy on the floor. Something she'd never normally do. Under different circumstances, I would scold her, but this was different. Aware of other customers, I tried to calm her. Now, now. 
We shouldn't throw things. As I tried to calm Mary and pick up the toy she had thrown. Suddenly. Grandma, let's get out of here. Mary grabbed my arm as I was reaching for the toy and shouted. What are you talking about? I noticed something had come out of the discarded toy. Like a piece of paper. Grandma, no! Ignoring Mary's plea, I looked at the folded paper and was horrified. It was covered in what looked like a spell. What is this? I remembered the suspicious calls at Jim's house, with a voice chanting a spell as soon as I answered. Could there be a connection? Noticing something was wrong, the manager came out from the back. Is there something wrong? He asked, offering a hand as I crouched. He seemed to notice the paper in my hand. What is this? The manager looked disgusted. Standing up, I explained the situation. The unpleasant server just glared at Mary, silent. I'm very sorry. The manager apologized, but the woman wouldn't take her eyes off Mary. I feared for Mary's safety and hugged her close, addressing the woman. Even though the manager has apologized, don't you have anything to say? I had tried not to upset her, but it seems I reached my limit too. My tone became a bit harsh. Perhaps triggered by my tone, the woman suddenly shouted. If it weren't for this brat. She lunged at Mary. Instinctively, I shielded Mary, and the woman scratched me, yelling. Move! Let go! The manager tried to stop her, but he couldn't restrain her alone. Hearing the commotion, several male staff members subdued her, and someone had called the police. Mary started crying out of fear. I'm sorry, Mary. I said, holding my scratched area and comforting her trembling body. Before the situation escalated further, Mary and I were taken to the restaurant's office. The woman was there too. Emma, why did you do that? The manager asked her, but she remained silent. I'm really sorry. The store manager apologized to us again. As I was pondering over the situation, the police arrived. Emma, 33 years old. I overheard her name during the separate questioning. I told the police about Emma's aggressive behavior towards Mary for not eating her hamburger and about the suspicious paper in the toy. Then, Mary, who had been listening. Grandma, it's not that. She tugged at my sleeve. What's wrong? I asked, but she seemed hesitant. Mary, can you tell me that story? A young police officer gently encouraged her. I saw it. When I was going to the bathroom, that woman put shrimp in the hamburger. Mary hesitantly testified. It was a fact I hadn't known. So that's why you didn't eat it? It sounded like Emma clicked her tongue. The young officer seemed to realize. This child has a shellfish allergy. He finally understood and asked the manager to check if the hamburger was still available. Too bad, it must have been disposed of by now. Emma spoke up for the first time after the two had left the office. Crossing her arms and legs with a disdainful look. Could you answer our questions as well? The officer sighed in disbelief at her questioning. That's what I've been saying. I have nothing to tell. I'll keep silent, silent. Emma fell silent again idly playing with her loosely permed hair, looking bored. Her demeanor changed drastically when the manager and the young police officer returned to the office. In the officer's hand was a plate with a cold hamburger. Uh. Emma looked as if she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Under the police officer's supervision, the manager cut the hamburger open. Inside wasn't just shrimp, but also crab meat used in crab cream croquettes. Does this restaurant's hamburgers normally contain shrimp and crab meat? The officer asked. Probably for confirmation. No, they do not. The manager seemed disappointed. Then, everyone in the room turned their gaze towards Emma. 
She kept her head down and didn't move, but then she started to shake her shoulders. Emma. When the manager spoke to her, a small voice leaked out. I thought she might be crying. But it turned out she was trying to suppress laughter. Lifting her face, she finally couldn't hold back and burst out laughing loudly. I got caught. Her voice was buoyant, like someone caught in a mischievous act, clearly enjoying herself. I'll tell you everything. But I want that handsome guy over there, not you. She pointed at the young police officer after hearing our conversation. Behave yourself. The officer who had been questioning Emma scolded her. Oh, don't look so scary. Emma winked, but it seemed ineffective on the experienced officer. What a woman. I could only stare in disbelief at the scene. The details Emma bragged about were beyond normal comprehension for me. She claimed to be Jim's ex-girlfriend. A co-worker from his previous black company. Jim was treated as incompetent there, so Emma had broken up with him. However, upon hearing rumors of Jim's success at his new job, she attempted to reconnect. But Jim. Emma showed no remorse for her actions. I even graciously offered to get back together, and he rejected me. She complained. Understandably so. Jim was already married to Kate, and they had Mary. I thought if I could just deal with the child, he'd choose me over that plain woman. She spoke as if expecting understanding, but surely no one empathized. Emma had been monitoring Jim and Mary, engaging in harassment whenever she disapproved of something. The delivery orders I didn't recognize and the suspicious calls were her doing. When I started bringing Mary to this family restaurant, Emma also started working here, learning Mary's preferences and allergies. I was horrified. I even regretted inadvertently revealing Mary's allergy myself. I embraced Mary as she leaned against me. I thought I finally had my chance today. After confessing everything, Emma sighed with disappointment. When her story ended, the police officer took her away from the office. As she left, she glared at Mary and laughed creepily, which made me tighten my embrace. After apologizing to the restaurant staff for the inconvenience and thanking the person who saved the hamburger from being disposed of, Mary and I went back to Jim's house. We waited for Kate and Jim to come home and then told them about the day's events. That woman, she did what? Jim clenched his fist, trembling with anger, but Kate gently enveloped his hand. I had heard about her, but what a terrible woman. Kate knew of her from Jim's stories. If only I had rejected her more firmly. No, it's not your fault. I should have been more careful, too. Leaving everything to Ellie and even making her scared. Both Jim and Kate blamed themselves. I felt the same. Had I adequately protected Mary while she was in my care? In the heavy silence, Kate finally spoke. At least Mary is safe. That's all that matters. To ensure such an incident wouldn't repeat, we discussed and decided that Jim's family would move. Emma was sentenced to a severe prison term for attempting to harm a child. Unsatisfied with the verdict, she became frenzied and violent in court, looking possessed. Watching her from the gallery, Kate and I decided to remodel our home to protect Mary from that demon again. Emma continued to chant spells in prison, deemed insane, and was eventually transferred to a psychiatric ward. I was certain she wouldn't leave there. Watching her frenzied state confirmed my belief. But still, we needed reassurance. Jim's family moved into a home equipped with security cameras, alarms, and immediate security response. Kate switched to part-time work for more flexibility and spent more time with Mary. We were determined never to let Mary be scared again. We likely still share that sentiment. Grandma, why do you look scared? Five years later, Mary, soon to be a fifth grader, peered into my face. Oh? Did I look scared? 
I diverted the topic. Let's get ready. Aren't we going out to eat? And also called out to Kate and Mary's sister, Lucy. It was Saturday. Basking in the warm spring sunshine, we started walking. Mary held Lucy's hand as they walked ahead, while Kate and I followed, watching their backs. If you don't want kids, maybe I'll have them. Maybe I should just divorce and we have them. Suddenly, the word divorce popped up at an oddly serene dinner table. My heart skipped a beat and I inadvertently stopped what I was doing. But I quickly lifted my head and faced the two of them again. All right, we're getting a divorce, then. Huh? Despite being the ones to bring it up, both looked surprised at my response. Seeing their reaction, I immediately backtracked on the divorce talk. Ah, uh, right, of course. You're obviously joking. Osamand laughed, relieved. Next to him, Carly covered her mouth with her hand, chuckling along. But the truth is, I do want a divorce. However, I haven't gathered enough evidence yet. I'm far from ready to make a move. I want to set things straight with Osamand and others, but only when everything is in order. This conversation only made me more determined than before. Yeah, just kidding. I joined in on Osamand's laughter, making sure not to let on that I'm serious about wanting a divorce. My name is Lena. I'm 27. I used to work in an office at a design company, but after getting married, I quit my job to become a housewife. My husband's name is Osamand. We met at a party I was invited to by a friend. I've never been good at socializing. On days off, I'd stay in, and even on workdays, I'd skip out on drinking parties and outings, preferring to spend time alone. Because of that lifestyle, it's no surprise I hadn't had a boyfriend in a while. All my friends and juniors were either married or in relationships. It made me anxious whenever the topic of boyfriends or husbands came up. I felt the pressure to find someone soon when this opportunity came from a friend. My friend was surprised I took up the invitation. Wow, I invited you without expecting much. I know I'm the one that invited you, but did something happen? Nothing really. Just had a change of heart. I'm getting to that age where I should find a boyfriend and start thinking about the future. I shared my thoughts without holding anything back. Then, ah, uh, I see. You've had a change of heart. I'm glad I invited you. My friend said, laughing. On the day of the party, I went to the bar which was the venue with my friend, and a few people were already there, chatting and having a good time. She easily joined the group, but I couldn't. Even as the party started, I couldn't manage to join in on the conversations and ended up drinking alone at the edge of the room. I wondered if it was impossible for someone like me to find a boyfriend. I stared at my nearly empty glass, lost in thought. The lively chatter from around me filled the air. My friend seemed to be enjoying the party, being at the center of the conversation. I envied those who could genuinely enjoy such gatherings. I wished I could be like that. As I looked at my watch thinking about leaving early, someone approached me. Hey, what's up? You look pretty lonely over here. Huh. A man started talking to me. That man would later become my husband, Osamand. Would you like to talk with me? Yes, I would. Osamand took a seat next to me, placing the drink he had been sipping on the table. We had introduced ourselves earlier, so we knew each other's names. So, you're Lena, right? Yes, and you're... Osamand. That's right. Thanks for remembering my name. Osamand thanked me, looking genuinely pleased. After that, we didn't join the rest of the group, opting instead to continue our conversation just between the two of us. We started with work, then moved on to hobbies, and even where we lived, 
the topics varied. Wow, really? Osaman seemed to pick up on my nervousness and made an effort to keep the conversation lively. Before I knew it, I was swept up in his enthusiasm, and my nervousness had vanished. Osamand was having fun talking, and he seemed genuinely interested in listening to me. Eventually, I found myself becoming fond of Osamand. I myself thought I was too easy. But for someone who doesn't usually talk to people, this was enough to make me take notice. After the party ended, we went to a bar to continue drinking, just the two of us. Alone with me, Osaman's demeanor changed completely from before, becoming more composed. Perhaps he had been playing up to the atmosphere before. Yet, his willingness to listen to me remained unchanged. Seeing this side of Osaman made my feelings for him grow. Today was fun. Thank you. Thank you as well. We hit it off so well that we exchanged our numbers and agreed to meet again. After that, we started seeing each other frequently. Could things really go this smoothly? The moment I decided to find a boyfriend, I was invited to a party and met someone compatible. I had expected more of a struggle, so I was a bit taken aback by how easily things were progressing. About two months after the party, Osamand confessed his feelings, and we started dating. He was just as kind to me as he had been before we were officially together. Whenever we both had time off, we would go on drives or trips, spending time together. That said, Osamand was busy with work. So our schedules didn't always match up, and we probably saw each other less often than other couples might. But we made up for it with phone calls and emails. I was satisfied with that. To say I wasn't lonely would be a lie. I wanted to see Osamand more, to be with Osamand more. Those feelings only grew stronger day by day. However, on the days we could meet, I was filled with happiness. Each time, I was reminded of how much I liked Osamand. Then one day, during our usual routine, Osamand suddenly introduced me to a woman. I want you to meet someone. Carly. She's an old friend of mine. Pleased to meet you. The woman introduced as Carly was Osamand's childhood friend. From what I heard, Osamand and Carly had been close since kindergarten, and they still visited each other's parents' homes and went out to eat together. Carly has always been such a great person. Oh, remember that time. Wait, why are you bringing that up now? I mean, it did happen, but... Osamand and Carly were completely engrossed in their own world, chatting away. Naturally, I had no idea how to navigate this situation. All I could do was watch them with a forced smile, feeling out of place. Noticing my discomfort, Osaman said. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I figured you'd be seeing Carly around, so I thought I'd introduce you. Honestly, I wondered why I needed to get along with his childhood friend in the future. But I wasn't strong enough to voice such thoughts there and then. I just went along with it, trying not to upset Osamand and his friend. Oh, is that so? But you didn't know I was meeting with you today, right? Sorry if it feels like I just showed up out of the blue. Not at all. Please don't worry about it. I'm really glad to meet you. Really? Thank you. Carly smiled sweetly, thanking me. However, as time went on, Osamand and Carly continued to create their own little world, leaving me feeling left out. At first, I desperately tried to join in their conversation, but eventually, I realized it was futile and just sat there, sipping my coffee alone. If they were going to talk amongst themselves, I wondered why I was even needed there. I felt a mix of sadness and emptiness, silently observing them. The situation didn't change until two hours later when I finally managed to excuse myself from their company, after being treated like I wasn't there. I'm really sorry. It's been a while since I've seen Carly. I see. 
No, it's totally fine. It's good that you got to catch up after so long. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm really sorry. Osamand apologized, seeming genuinely remorseful. It appeared he was aware that he had done something wrong. I couldn't help feeling slightly angry that he had created this exclusive world with Carly in the first place. No, really, it's okay. I accepted Osaman's apology without holding any grudge. After that incident, Osaman never brought up Carly again. Perhaps he realized it was a sensitive issue. He started to check on my feelings more, likely thinking he had indeed made a mistake. At the time, I felt lonely and insecure, but deep down, I knew it wasn't something to make a big deal about. After all, they were childhood friends. It made sense that they'd get caught up in conversation after a long time apart. However, I couldn't bring myself to say I was okay with Carly. I didn't want to dredge up the topic myself. A few weeks after meeting Carly, Osaman's behavior returned to normal, and it felt like our daily life had resumed. A year later, Osaman proposed, and we got married. The wedding was attended by family, friends, colleagues, and Carly. Carly seemed genuinely happy for us. Congratulations on your wedding. I'm sure you know, but Osamand is really a great guy, and I believe you'll be very happy together. Thank you. Carly made a point to come over to me and speak. Her smile was a complex mix of happiness and loneliness. After the wedding, we returned to the new apartment we had rented as a married couple. Though we were already officially married and lived together, I remembered when we moved in and felt somewhat embarrassed. Osamand was right there beside me. Just the thought of being able to share the same space with him from now on filled my heart with joy. I couldn't help but smile at the thought of our future together. I wanted to spend forever with Osamand. However, this happy life did not last long. Even after marriage, Osamand was still busy with work, but he made sure to spend as much time with me as possible. Except for when he had work dinners or special occasions, he would always come home before the date changed, and despite being tired himself, he would offer kind words to me as I did the housework. He was with me all weekend, taking me on trips and shopping. It might have seemed ordinary, but I felt truly happy with just that. But then, suddenly, a certain person started to intrude on our lives, significantly changing our routine. It was during a weekend shopping trip in town with Osamand. I spotted a familiar figure. It was Carly. She had seen us too and hurried over with a happy expression. Hey, Osamand, Lena. Carly. What a coincidence. As I was about to greet her, Osamand casually reached out and tousled Carly's hair. Hey, Osamand. You're messing up my hair. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. I just can't help it when I see you. I understood that they were close, but seeing them like this pained my heart. Osamand didn't seem to think it was a big deal, and Carly didn't seem to mind. They started talking without paying any attention to me, reigniting a sense of emptiness within me. I didn't know what to do, so I just looked at nearby products and thought vaguely about where to go next. Despite being able to see me, Carly continued to talk to Osamand without any concern. The conversation lasted about 10 minutes before ending. Sorry. I didn't realize you two were on a date today my bad. It's fine. Right, Lena? Yeah, it's fine. Unable to deny it, I pretended not to mind. Since that day, Carly began to appear more frequently wherever Osamand and I went out together. I thought it was a coincidence the first two times, but after it kept happening, I couldn't help but think they were arranging it behind my back. Whenever they met, they acted as if it were a chance encounter. Wow! What a coincidence! That became their routine phrase. 
Once, I gathered the courage to ask. Um. Are you two in touch? Seeing each other so often when we're out, it seems unlikely to be just coincidence. However, they wouldn't admit it. No, it's just a coincidence. Right, Carly? Yeah. Just a coincidence. Happened to be, right? They laughed it off together. But their expressions seemed almost mocking. They would hold hands or touch each other's cheeks every time they met. Their level of physical affection seemed excessive. Despite being told they had always been this way claiming it was normal for childhood friends, something about it didn't sit right with me. Ah, uh, wait, should we stop holding hands? Lena looks mad. Ah, uh, sorry, Lena. But Carly is really just an old friend. There's absolutely nothing weird between us, so don't worry, okay? Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Well, it's not like I like you or anything. After Carly's comment, Osamand cheerfully placed his hand on her head again. Despite my anger, Osamand continued his physical affection with Carly. Carly didn't seem to mind at all. Is it normal for childhood friends to be this close? Watching Osamand and Carly, my distrust grew day by day. After several similar incidents, I mustered up the courage to speak to Osamand. Um, Osamand. What's up? Osamand looked at me with his usual kind smile. Um, about Carly. I know she's your childhood friend, and I understand you're close, but could you maybe reduce the physical affection a bit? Reduce it! Yeah, since we're married. Osaman's face turned serious for a moment before he relaxed again. That brief serious expression scared me, making me regret bringing it up. Ah, uh, sorry. Was it bothering you? A little. Normally, Osamand would laugh it off and agree. But he was different that day. But you know, Carly and I are just childhood friends, right? There's really nothing to worry about. What does that mean? Just don't think too much about it. Consider it part of our communication. Okay. With a troubled smile, he walked away from me. Seeing this, I couldn't help but feel anxious, regretting my question and wondering if I had made an unreasonable request or upset Osamand. At the same time, I questioned if I was wrong. As his wife, I wanted him to limit his physical contact with Carly, even though they were childhood friends. Nonetheless, life with Osamand continued uneasily. A month after my request, nothing had changed. In fact, it seemed to get worse. Carly started to intrude on our home. She would come over on weekdays and weekends, eat, and then leave. With me preparing everything, Carly would just show up suddenly, spending time talking to Osamand on the sofa. Even when I asked for help with carrying things. You can handle that much on your own, right? Yeah! She would dismiss my request. By this time, Osamand had completely taken Carly's side. He hardly listened to me and always spoke in Carly's favor when I objected. Seriously. Lena can't do anything by herself. Hey, don't say that in front of her, that's the worst. They laughed at me as if I were a joke. Naturally, I didn't feel good about it. Whenever I returned to the kitchen without saying anything, I would end up being criticized. Eh, is she sulking? Over just this? Come on, that's a bit much, isn't it? I continued preparing the meal, trying to ignore their voices. It seemed only fair that she help with preparations since she came over uninvited. Yet, why should I be the one to face complaints? Moreover, being accused of sulking or being incapable of doing anything alone was incredibly rude. Carly came over several times a week. And she always made sure to have a meal before leaving. Even during meals, there was no sense of calm. 
Carly would sit next to Osamand, constantly pestering him. Osaman seemed to not mind her actions. They would feed each other or share laughs, looking entirely like a couple to anyone observing. But it turns out Carly actually had a fiancé. Named Raymond. He worked at the same company as Carly, holding a rather prestigious position. Though I heard he was abroad currently. Still, I thought it inappropriate for someone engaged to engage in such excessive physical intimacy with their childhood friend. Carly, could you maybe stop coming over so often? The food costs are adding up, and it's more work to cook. However, Osaman just laughed off my request. Come on. Carly's single right now, and she says it's lonely going home to an empty house. Maybe we should be a bit more understanding. But... It's fine, really. Osaman didn't seem inclined to criticize Carly at all. In fact, he seemed happier with her than with me. I wondered why Osamand couldn't show me the same smile. Eventually, I began to despise not only Carly but also the sight of Osamand smiling at her. A year into our marriage, Carly's intrusions continued unabated. By this time, I had given up, no longer complaining and simply catering to Carly. Maybe this was the arrangement Osamand and Carly desired. Their physical intimacy intensified, and they appeared even happier than before. I dreaded that this lifestyle would persist until Carly got married. The thought filled me with gloom. Divorce. The words started to cross my mind occasionally. Yet, I found it hard to take any action. Time kept moving forward. But one day, a comment from Carly prompted me to decide on divorce. Hey, aren't you two planning to have kids? What? Her tactless remark made me exclaim in surprise. Osamand and I had decided not to have children yet. And we might never do so. That's what I thought I had said, but... Ah, uh, Lena's just really against it. What? I never said that! I hadn't said anything of the sort. Osamand was trying to look good in front of Carly. I glared and contradicted him. Really, Lena? It's been about a year since you got married, right? Why would you be against it? No, I never said I was against. But Carly wasn't listening at all. Didn't Osamand like kids? Lena, isn't it selfish to say no? I'm not being selfish. I never said that. It's a real concern. Osamand continued to take Carly's side. Even in this situation. Choosing his childhood friend over his wife. It made me realize for the first time that perhaps I couldn't continue going on with him. Then Carly said something outrageous, pushing me further. If you don't want kids, maybe I'll have them. Maybe I should just divorce and we have them. Osaman joined in with her laughter, not rebuking Carly's words. The casual mention of divorce shocked me, my heart raced, and I stopped what I was doing. Divorce. There are jokes that can be made and ones that shouldn't be. The inability to distinguish between the two was exasperating. However, I quickly faced them again. All right. We're getting a divorce, then. Huh? They were surprised, even though they brought it up. I quickly corrected the notion of divorce. Just kidding. Maybe it's time we started thinking about kids. Ah, uh, right, of course. You're obviously joking. Osamand laughed, relieved. While Carly covered her mouth beside him, smiling joyously such a happy occasion. But the truth was, I did want a divorce. Despite joking about it, I couldn't shake the thought. I'll really get a divorce. Annoyingly, Carly's remark made me decide to divorce Osamand. Yet, it was too early to act. Yeah, just kidding. While formulating a plan in my head, I responded to Osamand. From observing Osamand and Carly up close, 
I suspected they might be having an affair. If that was the case, my options were limited. After much thought, I decided to hire a detective to gather evidence of the affair. I also tried to sneak a peek at Osaman's mobile phone to gather evidence myself. If they weren't cheating, I'd think of something else. But there was no need. When I checked Osaman's unlocked phone, there was an abundance of exchanges with Carly. The content was damning. From sweet conversations akin to those of lovers to suggestive messages and photos from hotel visits. There was more than enough to call it evidence. Considering Osamand didn't lock his phone, he seemed utterly careless. Further investigation by the detective confirmed they met frequently. Mostly at hotels. The dates they met matched the days Osaman told me he'd be home late. He had lied about overtime and drinking parties to meet Carly. Even though I had a vague idea they were cheating, seeing concrete evidence made me feel indescribable. Meanwhile, Osamand and Carly's behavior didn't change. Carly kept coming over, eating, teasing me, and having fun. Unaware of what I was doing behind the scenes, their carefree actions seemed almost ludicrous. About a month after I started gathering evidence, Osamand invited me to an event. There's an engagement party for Carly next month. Engagement party? Yeah, you know Carly's fiancé is pretty high up, right? So, they need to have a sort of introduction party for the marriage. So, her partner is coming back? Yeah, I think he might already be back. The engagement party was irrelevant to me. The nerve of having such a party while engaging in an affair baffled me. I see. You've been invited? You should go. I said dismissively, somewhat irritated by Osaman's nonchalant laughter. But his response was unexpected. What are you talking about? You're coming with me. Me? With you? Why? Because you've always been so helpful to Carly. Oh, I see. She wants me there because I was helpful. Did they really invite me for that reason? My heart, already jaded, doubted even the reason for my invitation. But it would be rude to decline if I was invited. I thought you might not like parties. Can you manage? No, I'll go. She invited me, after all. Osaman's face brightened at my words. Great. I'll let Carly know. He seemed pleased as he went to his room with his phone likely to contact Carly. In truth, I didn't want to go. The last thing I wanted was to see Carly happy. Why should I put myself in such a situation? However, as I prepared, an idea struck me. This plan could significantly change my current predicament. If so, using the party to my advantage was too good an opportunity to miss. What I'm about to do is low as a person. But I had been tormented by Osamand and Carly far more. A little revenge seemed justified. I prepared for the party and my plan of retaliation simultaneously. A month later, the day of the party arrived. Dressed appropriately, Osamand and I headed to the venue. Entering the venue, the opulence of chandeliers, carpets, and tables made me hesitate. The old Osamand would have reassured me here, but now he was busy scanning the room for someone. The guests all seemed important, making me feel out of place. Then, someone called out. Ah, Osamand! You made it! Turning toward the voice, I saw Carly. Accompanied by a fresh-faced young man and a kindly-looking elderly couple. Apparently, the young man was Carly's fiancé, Raymond. And the elderly couple were her parents. Congratulations, Carly! Thank you! And to you too, and Raymond too! Congratulations! Thank you for your kind words. Osamand was unusually polite. A side of him I might have never seen before. Afterward, 
The party officially began with an announcement. After getting my meal, I returned to my seat to find Osamand and Carly's parents engaged in a lively conversation. Osamand, you and Carly are childhood friends, right? What was she like back then? Carly back then? Hey, that's kind of embarrassing. Osamand, unfazed by Carly's embarrassment, shared stories of her past. She liked catching bugs and racing. We used to play tag a lot. You're really going to tell that story? Carly squirmed, visibly embarrassed. But not entirely displeased. You two really are close. Watching you, it's like your real siblings. I knew it was impolite, but I couldn't let myself be swept along if I wanted to execute my plan. I apologized internally as I interjected. Osaman seemed surprised by my interruption. Eyes wide. Really? What's it like when Carly is with Osamand? They're very close. How should I put it? They're like lovers. Hey, Lena! Osaman tried to stop me, but I continued. Carly often comes over for meals. She talks with Osaman the whole time I'm preparing food, looking very happy. During meals, they feed each other, hold hands. They're really close. Hey, what are you? I could feel the atmosphere freeze with my words. Carly's parents and Raymond looked at Osamand and Carly as if they couldn't believe what they were hearing. Feed each other? Yes. Oh, I don't have photos of them feeding each other, but I do have pictures of them looking very close and their exchanges. Would you like to see? Hey! Lena! Before Osamand could stop me, I opened my mobile phone to show the evidence gathered by the detective and myself. Raymond's face paled significantly upon seeing it. Lena! Don't say weird things! Weird? I'm just sharing the truth. This is how you two usually are. Osamand bit his lip, unable to say anything, his expression sour. But Carly lashed out at me. I felt vindicated. I had never seen Osamand and Carly look so frustrated. Deciding to go through with my revenge felt right. Lena! Stop being freaky! And why do you have these photos? You shouldn't know about this. What? Did you hire a detective? Unbelievable! Yes, I hired a detective. Why? Osamand was taken aback, realizing his actions with Carly, which went beyond mere childhood friendship, had been exposed. Wanna know why? I pulled out a completed divorce application from my bag and slammed it in front of Osamand. Let's get divorced. I can't take it anymore. There's no need to say that here. Ever since we got married, Carly has been a constant presence in my life. We ran into her whenever we went out, and despite asking you to keep distance, she came over for dinner multiple times. And to top it off, you lied about working late to meet her at hotels. What's the point of being married then? I let it all out. Osaman's loud response had drawn the attention of everyone in the venue. I know it was wrong, but... If you knew it was wrong, why didn't you stop? Didn't I ask you to stop repeatedly? Well, yes, but... You don't really think it was wrong, do you? If you did, you wouldn't make excuses, you'd apologize. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. As Osamand and I argued, Carly attempted to intervene. Hey, stop arguing here! Raymond, Mom, Dad, help! However, the three of them did not take Carly's side. Carly, those photos are real, aren't they? What? I'm asking if they're real. Not that you'd admit to cheating on your own. Raymond looked profoundly disheartened. Understandably so. He must have been thinking of his fiancée Carly while working abroad. 
only to find her cheating with her childhood friend. With so much evidence, I can't marry you. I was a fool to trust you. Wait. That's not true. They're all lies. Lies? So, you're saying Lena fabricated all this just to trap you and Osamand? Yes, that's right. What? I couldn't hold back anymore. Was she not satisfied after manipulating me all this much? Still trying to control the narrative? Even now, Carly wouldn't admit to the affair, which infuriated me further, and I couldn't help but shout. Who would do such a thing for you? I don't have the time for that. If I were to spend my time on you, I'd rather find a new hobby. What did you say? Carly snapped back at my words. However, it was Carly's parents who stopped her. Carly! Enough! Aren't you ashamed of yourself for doing such things? Dad. I never thought you would do something like this. Sure, you and Osaman were close, but I never imagined it would lead to this. It's truly shameful. What? Don't say it's shameful. It is embarrassing. Raymond, I'm so sorry. It's understandable that you can't marry her now, and we won't mind if you call off the engagement. I too must apologize. I'm truly, truly sorry. Watching her parents apologize to Raymond, Carly seemed to realize the irreparable mistake she had made. Tears streaming, she pleaded with Raymond. I'm sorry. Please, don't call off the engagement. I've had enough of you. I can't marry you. No. Osamand, witnessing Carly's situation, also begged for my forgiveness. Lena, I'm really sorry. I'll never cheat again. Please, let's not divorce. But I couldn't possibly trust Osaman's words. Never cheat again? Unbelievable. I'm divorcing you. And I'll be claiming compensation too. Looks like your beloved Carly is getting dumped too, so you two might as well stay together. No, wait, think this over. Absolutely not. I can't live with someone like you any longer. I grabbed the divorce papers again and pushed them toward Osamand. There's no way we can rebuild from this. If you understand, agree to the divorce now. Realizing I was serious, Osamand no longer resisted and agreed to the divorce. Finally, I could get away from this man. And I wouldn't have to see Carly's face anymore. This realization brought a smile to my face. A few days later, Osamand and I were officially divorced. I managed to claim compensation from both Osamand and Carly, which was satisfying. Carly and Raymond officially ended their engagement too. Despite the scandal, neither Osamand nor Carly quit their jobs. I thought they might leave their positions due to the divorce and scandal spreading through their companies. However, it seems they couldn't afford to quit, needing to pay the compensation. In a way, that served them right. Thinking so might mean I have a bad personality too. After the divorce was finalized, I apologized to Raymond for ruining the party. But he kindly said, No worries. Thank you for letting me know about Carly's affair. It was a big help. A year after divorcing Osamand, I'm living comfortably alone, working a new job in a new city. I'm not sure what Osamand and Carly are up to, but the compensation is being deposited monthly, so they must be managing somehow. It seems I'm better off living alone than with someone. I probably won't marry again. I cherish these happy days and plan to continue enjoying my favorite tea alone. I've always disliked you. Not going to work and not earning a single cent. Just sleeping at home all day. You might as well leave right now. 
Miranda, my mother-in-law, yells, brandishing a kitchen knife at me. I fear she might actually kill me. My heart is pounding so hard, I can hear it. Why don't you say something? Miranda, still holding the knife, advances towards me. If I keep quiet, she might actually stab me. Oh, okay, I understand. Please lower the knife, I'm begging you. Miranda accuses me of not earning anything, but in reality, it's my husband Frank who hasn't brought in a single cent. I'll make her regret kicking me out. Rewinding to two years back, back then, I lived in Frank's in-law's house with him and Miranda, just the three of us. Karen, I'm really grateful you moved into my parents' home. Thank you. Frank said, expressing his gratitude. After father-in-law suddenly passed away from a stroke, we started living in the in-law's house. If you guys don't mind, feel free to move in and use this place, Miranda suggested following my father-in-law's funeral. The in-law's house is a bit larger than a typical house. My father-in-law, who had worked his way up to a senior manager at an auto parts manufacturer, earned a decent income. Really? That would be great. If we could live in the parents' home, we're familiar with it, and I've been wanting to move out of the apartment. Frank was eager about Miranda's suggestion. Indeed, it wasn't a bad deal for us. Due to the impact of an infectious disease, Frank's company underwent major layoffs. Frank was among those laid off and is currently searching for a job while working part-time at a grocery store. I, on the other hand, work full-time at a securities firm, and my earnings are just enough to keep us afloat. Miranda, about living in the in-laws' house, I'd be really grateful if we could. Thank you. Thinking it a good opportunity, I decided to live in the in-laws' house. However, I wasn't very close with Miranda and hadn't talked much with her, so I was honestly anxious about living together. Could we get along? I wondered. Before moving into the in-laws' house, I discussed our future living situation with Frank. I haven't really talked much with Miranda, and I'm worried about whether we can get along. Don't worry. Even if things get bad with Mom, I'm on your side, Karen. Assured by Frank's words, I felt slightly relieved and moved into the in-laws' house a week later. Welcome. Feel free to make yourself at home. Miranda greeted us. Thank you. We appreciate your hospitality. Frank and I, starting our new life in the in-law's house, had modest earnings and lived simply, but it was more comfortable than our previous apartment. On our days off, we could go out together, almost like when we were dating, a luxury we couldn't afford due to constant financial worries. I thought I could continue living happily with Frank in the in-law's house. However, three months after we started living in the in-law's house, Miranda's attitude towards me changed drastically. Karen, what's the idea of moving into my house and not doing any cleaning or laundry? What? I always do them when I get back from work. Although Miranda sometimes did the chores when I came home late from work, I usually took the initiative in cleaning and laundry. You're married to Frank and staying in my house. Shouldn't it be normal for you to take care of everything? especially since you're living here. I thought, wasn't it you who suggested we move here? But I couldn't bring myself to argue with Miranda. I invited you to live here to lessen my burden, you know? Why can't you understand that without me having to spell it out? You're so slow. I had no idea Miranda felt that way. It was as if I was just a housekeeper. Stunned, I could only stand there speechless. From then on, Miranda started harassing me daily. Hurry up and clean. I don't want to hear any excuses about being tired from work. She knew I was tired from work, yet still forced household chores on me. I wish she would help instead of just waiting for me to do everything. Are the dishes done? Have you cleaned yet? You really can't do anything without me telling you. Maybe you're late from work because you're not competent enough. I haven't finished them yet. I'm sorry. You're so inefficient. Hurry up or it'll be morning before you know it. Miranda would kick me as she said these things. Why do I have to endure this treatment? The daily harassment from Miranda continued, leaving me physically and mentally exhausted. This lifestyle persisted, and I eventually fell ill. Miranda, I'm sorry, but it seems I've caught a cold. Can you take care of the housework for me? What are you talking about? You can clean even if you have a cold, can't you? I have a high fever and can't move my body properly. Ugh! You're so useless. Figure it out, okay? I'm not doing it. Despite my high fever, Miranda insists on making me do the housework. 
I really need to lie down. That day, since Frank had the day off from his part-time job, I asked him to help with the chores. Could you take over the housework until I feel better? What? You want me to do the housework? You should do it. I'm busy too, you know. Busy with what? You're not working every day. You're just lounging around today. Hey, that's not fair. I'm desperately looking for a job. It doesn't look like it. I don't see you looking at job listings. And you quit your part-time job. Living in your parents' home, you're honestly too lazy. I vented my frustrations at Frank. Lately, I've been losing affection for him, who just lazes around every day. Anyway, I'm busy, so you do the cleaning and laundry. Frustrated with Frank's uncooperative attitude, I reluctantly agreed. Fine, I'll do it. It's so hard to even stand. Cleaning, which usually takes less than an hour, took me two hours due to my limited mobility. While doing laundry, I felt sick and vomited in the bathroom. Trying to take a break, I rested on the living room sofa. What are you lounging around for? You don't have time for that. Get moving. While saying this, Miranda hit me and forced me off the sofa. If I were in good health, I could have finished everything before she had a chance to complain. Despite my high fever and hazy consciousness, I somehow managed to complete all the household chores, including cleaning, laundry, and cooking. The next morning, I immediately noticed something was wrong with my body. I can't move. I'm in too much pain. The strain from yesterday didn't help my fever, and my joints were incredibly sore. I had to call off work again. I still have a fever. I'm sorry, but I need to take another day off. That's okay. Be careful with the infectious diseases going around. Get well soon and come back to work. My boss was considerate and kind. If only Miranda and Frank could be like my boss. Having secured another day off work, I was about to go back to sleep when suddenly, Karen, come here right now. Miranda yelled, calling for me abruptly. I wonder what she wants this time. Struggling to keep my balance, I made my way to the living room where Miranda was. What's wrong? I was just about to go to bed because I'm not feeling well. Why are you home at this time? Usually you would have gone to work by now. I noticed your car was still here and wondered what happened. Looking at the living room clock, it was 8.30 a.m. Indeed, by this time, I should have already been at work. Yes, that's true, but I think I overdid it with the housework yesterday, and my fever hasn't subsided, so I took another day off. What? Are you saying it's my fault? I'm not saying it's your fault, but if you had helped with the chores, maybe I could have rested and wouldn't need to take another day off. After saying this to Miranda, I went to the kitchen to drink some water as my throat was dry. Miranda followed me into the kitchen. Wait a minute. You should be earning money and contributing to the house. You know Frank is struggling without a job. Who do you think will earn the money? I realized that Miranda saw me as a convenient woman who earns money without complaint and can be treated like a housekeeper. I think that's why she invited us to the in-law's house. Having lived a comfortable life off the earnings of my late father-in-law, who seemed to have hired housekeepers, Miranda couldn't lower her standard of living. But Miranda, with the infectious disease going around, it would be irresponsible to go to work in this condition. The moment I said that, Miranda grabbed a knife and yelled at me. Don't talk back. You're just a moocher, not going to work and just sleeping at home. If you're not going to earn a cent and not do any housework, then just get out of this house. Her eyes bloodshot, Miranda thrust the knife towards me. I realized I might actually be killed if I didn't leave right now. My heart raced, but I was frozen in shock and couldn't move. Say something, will you? Paralyzed with fear, I finally mustered the courage to tell Miranda that I would leave. Oh, okay, I understand. Please lower the knife, I'll leave. Then leave now. Miranda, still holding the knife, yelled even louder. At that moment, Frank, hearing the commotion, came into the living room. Seeing Miranda pointing the knife at me, he panicked and intervened. What the heck are you doing? Put that dangerous thing away now. Frank scolded Miranda and made her lower the knife. This was my chance. While Miranda was distracted by Frank, I seized the opportunity to flee the in-law's house and headed for my parents' home. Miranda kept saying I didn't earn anything, but in reality, it was Frank who wasn't earning. I'll make her regret kicking me out. The parents' home and the in-law's house are about an hour's drive apart. 
As I drove, I regained my composure and was filled with anger towards Miranda. Pointing a knife at someone is unforgivable, no matter the circumstance. With these thoughts, I stopped my car in a grocery store parking lot, about five minutes away from the in-law's house, and called the police to report that Miranda had threatened me with a knife. The police said they would go to the in-law's house to talk to Miranda, but asked, Can we speak with you at the scene to get your account of what happened? What? Go back to that house? I thought I was going to be killed. I can't face Miranda again. It's too scary. It was a ridiculous idea. I had been terrified Miranda would kill me. I refused to go back to the in-law's house and explain the situation over the phone, including the past incidents of assault. Understood. We'll speak with Miranda about it. After speaking with the police, I drove for about an hour to my parents' home. I explained everything to my parents and decided to stay there for a while. Feeling unwell and unable to do anything, I finally had a good night's sleep at my parents' home for the first time in a while. The next day, feeling much better, I managed to go to work, but throughout the day, I received several missed calls from Miranda and Frank. I ignored them during work, but the calls kept coming even after I got home. Reluctantly, I answered the phone. Yes, what is it? What do you mean, what is it? How could you just leave like that? You abandoned Frank, and I heard you reported me to the police. You're the one who told me to leave, threatening me with a knife. If Frank hadn't stopped you, I thought you were going to kill me. Of course I reported it. I wouldn't really kill you. I didn't think you'd actually leave. Come back home right now. I'm not coming back to that house ever again. Frank doesn't even try to work, and I'm considering divorce. I said that and hung up the phone. Within five minutes, Frank called. I didn't want anything to do with Frank or Miranda anymore, but I answered the call. What do you want? Mom told me you're thinking about divorce. Isn't that too sudden? It might be sudden, but you never seem to try to find a job. I can't stay with someone like that. I am trying to find a job. If you were really trying, you could have asked for more shifts at your part-time job to help with our finances. I was trying to work hard, too. What do you know? You don't understand how the layoff affected me. Fine, if that's how you feel, I'll give you a divorce. Frank said that and abruptly hung up the phone. I never wanted to say such things to Frank. But he wouldn't look for work, and he did nothing to defend me from Miranda's harassment, even though he knew it was happening. I moved to the in-law's house because Frank had promised. If anything happens, I'll be on your side. That's what I had thought. Two days later, as he had said on the phone, Frank sent the divorce papers and my belongings that I had left at the in-law's house to my parents' home. Why did I even marry such a person? We used to love each other, but now I feel nothing for him. Let Miranda, who chased me out, and Frank live happily ever after and regret chasing me away. The next morning, now divorced and alone, I enjoyed some personal time at my parents' home for the first time in a while, thinking about Frank and Miranda. That's when it happened. Hello? This is the police. Following your report, Miranda admitted to brandishing a knife. She has been arrested for threatening behavior and wants to settle, but what do you want to do? Really? No way I'm settling. Please tell her I absolutely refuse any settlement. I was elated when the police called to say Miranda had been arrested. There was no way I was going to settle with someone who had exploited and tried to kill me. Hearing Miranda had been caught, I clenched my fist in triumph proudly telling the police that I would not settle. Let Miranda regret her actions in prison. After about 30 days in detention, Miranda was sentenced to two years in prison. I thought this would teach her a lesson. That's what I thought. But a month after divorcing Frank, he suddenly showed up at my parents' home. Just when I thought things had settled down with Miranda, now Frank. Long time no see. Have you been well? Frank stood at the door when I answered the bell showing no signs of remorse. What do you want? Please leave. At that moment, my parents were out, and I was the only one at home. Startled by his sudden visit, I knew I had no business with him anymore. I said things in the heat of the moment about divorce, but I want you back, please. Frank was pleading for reconciliation, but it was too late. I have no intention of coming back. Besides, we're already divorced. Please don't say that. Can't you come back? In the end, Frank begged me to return to the in-law's house crying. Concerned about being watched by the neighbors, I let Frank inside to talk. 
So, as I asked earlier, why did you just show up out of the blue? I don't have anything to do with you anymore, and your sudden visit is troubling. Actually, Frank started to speak slowly in response to my question. Since you left, I've had no income and can't sustain a living. That's why I was wondering if you could come back. How much more useless can this man be? He agreed to the divorce, and now he's asking me to return because he has no money? That's too convenient. Why don't you just work hard yourself instead of expecting me to come back? Well, that's true, but I haven't found a job yet. I'm really trying. I think I'll find something soon. Please. There's no way I'd return to the in-law's house after all this. Frank, do you really expect me to believe that now? I've been asking you to work ever since we were married, and you still don't have a job. You probably think I'll come back if you say anything. There are plenty of part-time or contract jobs, even if you can't get a full-time one. It's clear you just don't want to work. Plus, Miranda threatened me with a knife, and I was genuinely scared. If I return to the in-law's house, it'll be the same as before. I'll do all the chores while you do whatever you want, right? Even though Miranda is arrested for now. I won't let that happen again. Next time, I'll definitely be on your side. No, I'm sure Miranda will do the same thing again. It's not normal for a mother-in-law to threaten her daughter-in-law with a knife, right? I can't live with someone like that. Frank fell silent, having nothing to say. If you have nothing to say, then that proves my point. Can you leave now? Despite being asked to leave, Frank didn't move. My anger started to rise. I'm telling you to get out of this house! Startled by my shouting, Frank hurriedly left my parents' home. Although he left quietly that day, he began showing up at my parents' home every week, begging me to come back, regardless of whether my parents were home or not. My parents even said his behavior was abnormal. Karen, just come back, will you? Frank's yelling could be heard from the doorstep one day. Again, he shows up without learning his lesson. It's a nuisance to the neighbors, and I wish he would just give up. No matter how many times he comes, the result will be the same. I'm not going back. Please stop. It's bothersome when you show up unannounced like this. A phone call or a message would be more appropriate. But a call or a message wouldn't convey our feelings, right? There's meaning in meeting face-to-face and saying it directly. Despite my protests, Frank only insisted on me coming back. It was clear he didn't want to work anymore and was only after my earnings. So you say you're just after my money, aren't you? I don't want to see you anymore, so don't come here. If you come again, I'll call the police. I threatened to call the police to make him leave, but knowing Frank, he might keep coming back to my parents' home. Thankfully, Frank didn't show up at my parents' home for a while after that. It seemed he finally gave up. I was on the verge of losing my temper with Frank, who had become almost like a stalker. Just when I thought I was free from Frank, he called me a week after I moved. So you really have no intention of coming back? How many times do I have to tell you? It's annoying. Fine, then I'll kill you and myself. Why should I be killed by him? I haven't done anything wrong. Finally, I exploded with all the pent-up emotions and anger. Why should I be killed by you? Bring it on. A worthless man like you, who doesn't work and relies on a woman's income, can't kill anyone. Uh, no, I wasn't serious. Don't say such things in the first place. I've been putting up with you, but you're an awful man. If you want to die, do it alone. Don't drag me into it anymore. I said this forcefully over the phone. Okay, I won't say that anymore. It's too late. I'm reporting to the police that you threatened to kill me. I hung up the phone thinking that would make Frank behave. As I told him, I reported to the police that Frank had threatened me. My ex-husband said he would kill me. Is that so? Where is this ex-husband of yours? I think he's at the in-law's house. We need to hear more about this. Could you come to the station? At the police station, I explained the situation. Even after our divorce, he's been showing up at my house every week. I told him we're divorced and I don't need him to come anymore. Then one day, he called, demanding reconciliation, and when I refused, he threatened to kill me. Would you like us to arrest your husband if his statement matches yours? The police asked me. Yes, I would prefer that. He's been acting like a stalker, and I honestly want him arrested as soon as possible. After telling the police this, I left the station. That night, 
I received a call that Frank had been arrested. Is this Karen's phone? Yes, what happened? We have confirmed from Frank, your ex-husband, that he did indeed say he would kill you. He hasn't harmed you, but considering your fear, we've arrested him. Finally, I would no longer be harassed by Frank and Miranda. I was so relieved that I danced on the spot when I received the call from the police. Really? Thank you. Now I can finally relax. After hanging up, I felt glad that I had never given in to Frank and Miranda. I shuddered to think what might have happened if I had returned to the in-law's house. They were people who could threaten with a knife and utter death threats. Eventually, both were arrested, bringing me peace of mind. Frank always relying on my earnings without working, and Miranda constantly harassing me with household chores, had dug their own graves. If Frank is charged with threats, he might face two years in prison just like Miranda. They should reflect on their actions in jail. Later, Frank was indeed convicted for his threats and sentenced to jail, joining Miranda for a two-year sentence. This brought me a sense of calm. However, there's a chance they might come to my house or my parents' home after being released. Considering this, I decided to move with my parents. Dad, Mom, if we stay here, they might come back. Should we move? Yes, it's a shame to leave our home, but your safety is more important. Let's move. Dad said that our lives are more important than clinging to our parents' home and decided to move. This way, even if they get released, nobody will be living in my parents' home anymore, and they won't know where we've moved to, so we'll be safe. Two years later, when Miranda and Frank were due for release, they hadn't come to my new place. I had changed my phone number and email address so they couldn't contact me. During that time, about a year after Frank went to jail, I remarried a man I met through work. He's two years older than me, hardworking, kind, and feels like too good of a person for me. Unlike Frank, he actively helps with household chores. We are expecting a child and planning to build our home. With Frank, I couldn't even dream of such happiness. Now, I look forward to a happy and long life with my husband and our future child. Part-timers don't have the right to speak. <laughs> When I transferred to a new workplace, I was greeted with these harsh words from a female manager, Kate, who even slapped me on the cheek. Overwhelmed by Kate's outrageous behavior, I felt my anger boil over. I decided then and there, without any hesitation, that I would fight back. My name is Mary. I'm a 50-year-old employee. I'm married to John, who is the same age as me. John works at a different company and has a very kind nature. We don't have children, but our marriage is strong, and one of our favorite things to do is to plan trips when we have extended breaks. We always look forward to deciding where to go next. I work at the headquarters of my company. The headquarters is considered a prestigious place to work, and the salary is quite decent. I never had to worry about money, and I thought I could smoothly sail through life. I was asked to transfer to a subsidiary one day about a month ago. My boss explained that the subsidiary's performance was not up to par and wanted me to inspect and identify areas for improvement. I willingly accepted the task, not knowing it would turn into a nightmare. On my first day at the subsidiary, I attended the daily morning meeting. There, I introduced myself and greeted the employees. I just transferred here and have a lot to learn, but I'll do my best. Thank you for having me. Most of the employees responded with friendly smiles. It seemed like I was accepted, but one reaction stood out. It was from a manager, Kate. She's about 60 years old and has been a manager for around a year. She always dresses in high-end suits and wears famous brand necklaces. Kate looked at me with a scowl, clearly not pleased, but... What's this? Working your hardest? Sounds like a grade schooler's greeting. <laughs> Moreover, she loudly mocked me. The previously warm atmosphere instantly turned awkward. Everyone looked uncomfortable, but no one dared to confront Kate. It seems she wielded significant power here. No one senior to Kate attended these meetings, so there was no one to reprimand her. 
and soon it was evident why. Kate would harshly scold her subordinates for any mistakes. How can you not do such a simple task? You're incompetent. When I was your age, I'd have finished this in an hour. She would yell this and more, crossing the line from guidance to outright verbal abuse. One day, I couldn't stand it anymore and confronted Kate. Don't you think that's a bit too harsh? Such treatment could break the employee's spirits. But Kate dismissed me. Shut up. You're my subordinate, aren't you? Don't you dare talk back. With that, she left to get coffee, clearly irritated. I sighed. Wondering how someone could be so tyrannical. But Kate's problematic behavior didn't end there. She had a habit of dumping tedious tasks on her subordinates, inadvertently increasing their workload. Overtime was common in this department, and the employees often looked exhausted. Kate would say, I have tons of work as a manager. I have to constantly email clients and attend business dinners. While she appeared busy with her computer or going out, it was clear she was pushing her responsibilities onto her subordinates. Kate, the task you delegated the other day should be your responsibility. It's not good if you can't manage your own work. I can help you review your workflow if you'd like. I suggested this, but Kate erupted in fury. What? I can handle my own work. Your help is unnecessary. Instead of wasting time with pointless talk, get back to work. Her anger was so intense that I had no choice but to back down. After that incident, Kate completely targeted me. You're a 50-year-old woman, right? Probably tech illiterate. But in today's world, you need to use a computer. I'll give you plenty of computer tasks. Learn quickly. And master flying touch. Whatever that is. She said, intending to overwhelm me with work. But it's blind touch, not flying touch. Kate herself can't do blind typing. I've only ever seen her using her index fingers to type on the keyboard. Being looked down upon by such a person was unpleasant. While I'm not the strongest with computers, I've used them daily at the headquarters and can type without looking. I managed to complete the work Kate assigned me by the deadline. However, she seemed displeased and assigned me even more work. With unreasonable deadlines, it's impossible to finish this amount of work in such a short time. Please reconsider the workload and the deadline. When I said this, Kate laughed mockingly. <laughs> Can't you even handle the tasks you're assigned? This is the problem with incompetent middle-aged women. You've lived long but accomplished nothing. By the way, you mentioned traveling as a hobby, but are you sure you have enough savings for retirement? Maybe you should save a bit more. This made me angry. My hobbies and my work are unrelated, so let's get back on topic. You set a 10-day deadline, but it's feasible to complete this task in 20 days, right? I'll consider the deadline to be 20 days. After stating this firmly, I returned to my desk to start working. What I said was factual, so changing the deadline shouldn't be a major issue. However, Kate seemed to dislike this. Incompetent and can't even follow a supervisor's instructions. <laughs> and began to frequently hurl insults at me. The situation continued for a month, leading up to today. There's a regular meeting today, but I'm dreading it. Needless to say, the reason is Kate. Kate has no grasp of the work or the situation of her subordinates in her department. During meetings, she consistently makes absurd suggestions and opinions. When her subordinates gently point out issues, follow your supervisor's orders. She gets angry and forces her opinions on them. I'm already fed up with this, even though I've only been here for a month. As the usual meeting started, Kate began to assert her selfishness as usual. Today's first agenda was about how to improve work efficiency. Kate confidently stated her opinion. It's simple. Just take breaks while working, and tasks will naturally get done faster. No need to discuss this in a meeting. Let's move on to the next topic. The subordinate seemed to think, 
If only we could take breaks that easily. If they encountered Kate during their break, you sure can take breaks easily without doing your work. She would sarcastically say, Everyone sneaks in breaks when Kate isn't around, but it's not enough to fully recover. Worse, Kate tends to make arbitrary rules that hinder work efficiency. In the month I've been here, I realize this. Everyone wants to abolish these rules immediately, but they're too scared of Kate to say anything. Why can Kate behave so tyrannically? Because she's a relative of a high-ranking executive at the headquarters? In other words, she has connections. Moreover, Kate is overly friendly to those above her in rank. There was a past incident of her harassing subordinates, but she seemed very remorseful and avoided being fired. I've heard people in upper management at this subsidiary say that Kate isn't that bad. She's truly a troublesome person. However, I can't let the situation continue and have been planning to take action. On the day everything was prepared, I said during the morning meeting, There's a regular meeting scheduled today, but I have something important to discuss. Please allocate some time for it. Then Kate, looking angry, approached me. I thought it would be the usual sarcasm, but suddenly she slapped me on the cheek. Part-timers don't have the right to speak. <laughs> How dare you bring up a topic in a meeting? <laughs> Kate said, sneering. Overwhelmed by Kate's outrageous behavior, I felt my anger boil over. Slapping me on the cheek just because she dislikes me was too much. I decided then and there, without any hesitation, that I would fight back. First, it seemed Kate had a big misunderstanding about my position, so I decided to correct her. I'm not a part-timer. I'm a full-time employee, and didn't you know, I'm from the headquarters. At this, Kate's expression froze. Headquarters? <sighs> I let out a sigh intentionally. We've been working together for over a month, and you didn't know that. There should have been proper communication from the headquarters. Really? Kate rushed to her desk, rummaged through her messy papers, and pulled out a document. After reading it, It's true! She turned pale and said, Apparently, her lack of interest in work and poor document management led to her misunderstanding about me. I was surprised she hadn't realized it all this time. The others looked on, clearly dismayed. Kate must have seen her subordinates merely as tools for stress relief. Well, now that the misunderstanding is cleared up, let's get back to work. If we keep standing here talking, we won't finish our tasks. We still have time before the regular meeting, so let's continue our work as usual. After I said this, everyone returned to their desks and started working. Wait, we're not done talking. Don't ignore me. And act on your own. Kate was red with anger, but no one listened to her. Although they don't say it out loud, they probably want to say that they can't keep up with you. I don't feel like listening to instructions from people who misunderstand full-time employees as part-timers. Seeing everyone abandon Kate, she shouted, All of you are useless. You'll see what happens when you defy me. Then she stormed off. No one stopped her as her absence was more of a benefit to the workplace. Eventually, it was time for the regular meeting. Kate returned, begrudgingly. As the meeting started, I decided to make a significant announcement. Everyone, please listen. It has been officially decided to terminate Kate. One reason is her constant harassment of subordinates. Some people showed expressions of joy, while others looked worried wondering how Kate would react. They must be worried that Kate won't stay silent. In fact, Kate looks relaxed. Kate herself seemed confident, probably relying on her connections. I decided to bring her back to reality. Kate is close to Mike, a board member. It's been revealed that he's been embezzling and will be dismissed. The police have also been notified. Upon hearing this, Kate's face turned white. No way! How could this happen? 
As she panicked, I looked at her coldly. You've lost your backing and are now just a harassing supervisor. The upper management won't forgive you, even if you show remorse. Resistance is futile. But evidence? Where's the evidence? Without evidence, it's just your imagination. Kate's still trying to retaliate. I wonder what kind of nerve she has that she still hasn't reflected on her actions even after this period. Criminals often say, is there any evidence for that? So I revealed my final card. This is a voice recorder. I recorded all your abusive words, and the audio has been sent to the headquarters. They are well aware of how you've been a hindrance. Upon hearing this, Kate finally seemed to give up. But her misdeeds weren't over yet. Kate, there's still something you're hiding, right? Kate trembled as I glared at her. What else? I've only harassed my subordinates. Only harassed? Harassment is already a severe offense. Kate was lost for words. That's well. Back to the point. You've also been neglecting work, right? Our investigation revealed you played games during work hours, pretended to go out for work, but bought idle merchandise, and even napped on park benches. Your claims of communicating with clients were lies. The employees all directed cold stares at Kate. It must have been unforgivable for them to see a boss who was so strict about work actually slacking off. In her confusion, Kate blurted out a question. How did you know where I really went? I reported your frequent outings to the headquarters, suspecting something was amiss. The headquarters decided to hire an investigation firm to look into your behavior. That's a crime. Following me secretly is a crime. I calmly explained in response to her anger. I don't think this qualifies as a crime. It was done to investigate an employee's negligence, not for criminal purposes. Kate seemed to want to say more. But before she could, one of the employees spoke up. Crime or not, just apologize already. How can you not apologize after all this? The employee, usually quiet, was now visibly angry and red-faced. Other employees also started demanding an apology. Hearing their words, Kate began to tremble. Shouldn't you apologize properly? Reluctantly, Kate stood up and apologized to everyone. I'm sorry. I've been terrible and I accept my punishment. However, the criticism from the employees didn't stop. Eventually, Kate broke down in tears, but no one showed any sympathy. They just mentioned she was responsible for her actions. I felt no pity for Kate either. I'm sure Kate has a tough life ahead of her, but I just hope she suffers at the most. Kate was subsequently fired. I left my workplace feeling lonely, without a farewell party or a farewell gift. Kate not only spent too much money on her idol's goods, but also bought a lot of luxury items. Because of that, I was forced to find a new job immediately, as I had no savings. But given my age and overly specific conditions, it seemed difficult to find a good company. I'm utterly dismayed by Kate's continued selfish behavior, even after being fired for misconduct. I wish she would suffer a bit and realize how lenient she has been on herself. Eventually, Kate became financially desperate and had no choice but to take any job she could find. Reluctantly, she joined a company with a boss who was like a demon and younger than her. Unable to withstand her overly strict boss, Kate soon resigned. At the worst possible time, financially desperate, she got involved with a shady group. Consequently, Kate started peddling questionable health supplements and superficial information products. She tried selling to friends and relatives, but no one bought anything, and she lost their trust. Moreover, she even showed up at her former workplace, causing quite a stir. One of the employees threatened to call the police, so she left immediately, but I'm fed up with the trouble she causes. The reason I know so much about Kate's current situation is that she's unilaterally updating me during this commotion. Hearing the word police seems to have deterred Kate from coming to the workplace for now. 
I just hope she never returns. It seems Kate is still trying to sell those strange products, and her friends and relatives have completely cut ties with her. Being unmarried and childless, it looks like she's destined for a lonely life. Now, with no acquaintances to turn to, Kate started selling her products on social media. Someone from work showed me what I believe to be Kate's social media account. And it seems a few people have bought her products. I also heard she got into legal trouble for aggressively selling her products. I've come to understand she's a terrible person, and I'm determined to stay away from her. Meanwhile, I've been appointed as a manager at a subsidiary and I'm working hard every day. I abolished the necessary rules and established meaningful ones to make work more efficient. I'm careful about how I interact with my subordinates and make sure to listen to their concerns. Of course, I also make sure to do my job properly, to set an example for them. Thanks to these efforts, the atmosphere at work has brightened and there are fewer tired faces. I'm committed to continuing my efforts to create a workplace where everyone can work energetically and happily. My husband and I continue to get along well in our personal life. We recently stayed at a beautiful beach resort hotel during our vacation. My husband chose the hotel, wanting me to relax, as I had been tired from work. The food at the hotel was delicious, and it was a perfect way to refresh. It was tough dealing with such a terrible person, but I'm glad everything worked out in the end. I hope to continue having fulfilling days in both my work and personal life. It's no big deal, right? Costco has a membership fee and all, so it really helps out. Sarah tries to drag me along for her shopping trips just because she wants to go. Her attitude, only thinking of what benefits her, irked me so much that I repeatedly refused. But she just keeps insisting it's no big deal, making no progress in the conversation. Eventually, she even starts planning the day as if I've already agreed to go, despite my clear refusal. Sure, when should we do it? Thomas, my husband, suddenly joins the conversation and astonishingly agrees with Sarah, leaving me dumbfounded by his response. Hey, what are you thinking? That's Sarah, you know. She's definitely going to make us pay again. I'm planning to get back at her this time. It seems Thomas has some plan in mind to deal with Sarah's behavior. He's plotting some incredible revenge, but only if Sarah acts as shamelessly as she always does. I decided to go along with Thomas's strategy. I am Mary. This year, my child started kindergarten, and I've been busy with their education and neighborhood socializing. Luckily, most of the mom friends are kind, helping with various things about our kids and giving parenting advice. I try to help out when I can, feeling good about the strong relationships I've built. Except for one of the mom friends. Her name is Sarah. She's the only one who often needs help from me and others, claiming to be a self-proclaimed baby. She hardly ever reciprocates the help. For example, when the mom friends plan to eat out, she somehow appears and joins us often. That's not a big deal, but her attitude towards other people's food is. Can I have a bite? She often asks this. I don't have much cash on me today. She hints at wanting us to treat her. Other mom friends have shared similar experiences, feeling the same way about her. When I go shopping by car, she often appears, persistently asking for a ride. I don't mind if we are going to the same place, but Sarah is just too brazen. Ah, oh, I rushed out and forgot my wallet. What will you do? Go back to get it? No, it's too embarrassing now. Can I pay you back later? When I take her shopping, it always ends up like this. She forgets her wallet or leaves her card and makes excuses, never pulling out her wallet. She says she'll pay back later, but Sarah hardly ever does. Even when I show her the receipts and press her, she makes excuses like not having money or asking to wait until payday. You're really strict about money, Mary. Finally, when I confronted her directly, even involving Sarah's husband, that's what she said. Sarah's husband is reasonable and pays me back while apologizing. But Sarah herself shows no remorse and doesn't care. 
It may seem like a few dollars, but these incidents add up to a significant amount every month. It's stressful to have to go through all this every time I shop, trying to get reimbursed. It would be best to refuse her at the outset, but Sarah uses her child to manipulate the situation. Our kids are close, and she makes plans with my child before asking my permission. It's hard to say no when she uses the children, and I can't ask my young son not to be friends with her. Other mom friends sympathize, but it seems they also prefer to keep their distance from Sarah. Hey, can you go shopping for me instead? What? Why? That mom friend I told you about is being persistent. Just tell her no clearly. I tried discussing it with Thomas, but he didn't take it seriously, not knowing Sarah's character. He said children are children, parents are parents, and even told me to be more assertive. Wondering what to do, one day Thomas came home looking extremely tired. I thought it was work-related, but it turns out Sarah had cornered him as he was going to his car. Ah, oh, Thomas, perfect timing. Can you give me a lift on your way? While waiting at a traffic light, Sarah spotted our car and approached him. She tried to force her way into the passenger seat, not even considering Thomas might refuse. When Thomas refused, she threw a fit, screaming and calling out Thomas's name in the middle of the road, trying to call him back. It's crazy to yell like that on the street. That's what I've been telling you. Sarah is a handful. There's a limit to being a handful, right? Then she even asked for travel expenses. It turned out to be a terrible commute for Thomas with many traffic lights, making it hard to shake her off. After dropping her off, I wondered where Sarah, without any travel money, was planning to go. Thomas finally realizing the extent of Sarah's selfish behavior was completely worn out. What is she really thinking? That's why I wanted you to do the shopping. Even with me, she doesn't care, huh? Thomas looked bewildered, at a loss about what to do with Sarah. I was also at my wit's end. Then one day, Sarah approached me with a suggestion. Hey Mary, I've been wanting to go to Costco. Is that so? Wanna come with me? It's cheap and cost effective. Uh, do you go there often? No, I'm not a member. Sarah's sudden proposal left me giving non-committal responses. She seemed quite knowledgeable about Costco despite not being a member. Thomas is a Costco member, and we occasionally shop in bulk, so I was aware of it. However, I had no intention of taking Sarah shopping with me. I just nodded along, thinking she was probably after my wallet. Let's go, Mary! You're a member, right? I am not a member. Oh, then Thomas? That's fine, too, and I'd like a ride in your car. Why do you know about that? I got a ride from Thomas the other day. I saw Costco shopping bags in the car. Hearing this, I couldn't help but grimace and exclaimed, Oh, wow. You know, non-members can't even pay at Costco, right? So just leave the checkout to me. I'll pay you back later. You hardly ever pay back. It'll be fine this time, right? Even though I doubted her intentions, Sarah, as usual, spoke to my child. Can we go shopping together? She asked, and my son cheerfully agreed. Then, the kids can stay with my husband. We haven't agreed to go yet. Come on, it's fine, right? Costco has a membership fee, and it helps. I repeatedly refused Sarah, who only thinks of her own benefit, even telling her not to make promises using the children. But she wouldn't listen and started planning the day as if I had agreed. What's this about? Oh, Thomas, we were just about to make plans to go to Costco together. Sure, when should we do it? Thomas, who had come to pick me up, astonishingly agreed with Sarah, leaving me doubting my ears. Sarah happily ran to Thomas and quickly made plans to go to Costco the following weekend. After Sarah left, I nudged Thomas and couldn't help but complain. Hey, what are you thinking? That's Sarah, you know. I know, but she said she'd bring money, right? That's definitely a lie. She's going to make us pay again. I plan to get back at her this time. Thomas seemed to have something in mind to deal with Sarah's actions. Feeling anxious, I laughed when I heard this plan. He's plotting an incredible revenge, but only if Sarah acts as shamelessly as she always does. 
Plus, if this could make Sarah stay away from us, I found myself gratefully going along with Thomas's plan. Finally, the day to go to Costco arrived. Sarah, in a good mood from the morning, hopped into our car as if it was natural and asked me if I had forgotten anything. Did you make sure to bring your wallet? It'd be a problem if you forgot it. Aren't you the one who often forgets? Don't worry, I've got it. I was irritated by Sarah's words, but Thomas replied to her cheerfully. Normally, I would have asked her to show her wallet right there, but I held back, thinking of Thomas's plan. Sarah seemed well aware of Costco's system, knowing that only members can make payments. She probably knew that shopping there would inevitably lead to Thomas paying. This would allow her to push the payment onto us as usual. And even if she forgot her wallet later, she wouldn't have to pay. Sarah's intentions were clear and Thomas seemed to understand them too. Sarah cheerfully headed into the store, quickly placing a basket in the cart and rushing off. Wow, what a great selection! It's hard to choose! Sarah happily stuffed items into the basket as she went along. When I suggested keeping our baskets separate to avoid confusion, she took another cart and continued adding items without hesitation. Thomas whispered to me that Sarah wasn't even looking at the prices, which made me laugh. Clearly, Sarah had no intention of paying, so we decided to go through with Thomas's plan. That was fun! Oh, Mary, is that all you're buying? Yeah, we still have stock at home and we can always come back. Really? Invite me again next time? I swallowed the words, I didn't invite you this time and we lined up at the farthest register. As we watched the crowd at registers, Thomas took out his wallet and Sarah opened her bag. I watched closely as Sarah, rummaging through her small bag, predictably exclaimed, Oh? Oops, sorry, I think I forgot my wallet. Even though you said it was fine in the car? I'm sorry, okay? Can I pay you back later? Sarah's basket had much more stuff than ours seemingly worth about $200 to $300, but she showed no concern about the amount in her wallet. Without mentioning paying back later at home, it was clear she had no intention of paying. Thomas and I exchanged glances and nodded. Oh, really? Ah, uh, sorry, I think my parents are calling. I said this, handed my basket to Thomas and stepped away from the line, hiding near a nearby shelf to watch them. Sarah seemed unconcerned, chatting with Thomas. It's a shame you forgot your wallet after buying so much. Really a shame, but it's great to have a friend who'll pay for me. Hmm, oh, I forgot to buy something. Can you wait here in line for me? Uh, I guess I have to, but don't make me wait too long. Pacifying the dissatisfied Sarah, Thomas also stepped out of the line. Sunday mornings are especially busy at Costco, so as soon as Sarah turned to the register, she disappeared into the crowd. What now? I wonder. With a cart full of stuff, she can't just say she's not buying it, right? Exchanging these words and a wry smile from behind the shelves, we headed to the farthest register on the opposite side. Watching Sarah, she seemed to be slowly passing her place in line to the people behind, waiting for us. On a busy Sunday morning, with many people planning to have lunch there, it was unlikely for her to spot us from afar. We paid and left the store first. Getting into the car, we waited for a bit. Just as we were about to inform her, I saw a message from Sarah on my mobile phone. Hey, still? Come on, don't make me wait too long. Can't believe she's still online without her wallet. Maybe it's time to tell her the truth and ask her to come back to the car. Yeah. We laughed, seeing that she was still diligently waiting. I wondered what she would have done if we didn't have enough money to pay for all the stuff she bought. As expected when we told her we were already done with checkout and back at the car, an infuriated Sarah called us. Hey, what are you thinking? I haven't finished shopping yet. If you don't have your wallet, you can't shop in the first place. Come back soon. Don't be ridiculous. Stop joking and come back to pay. We're not paying. Do you have any idea how much money you've made us spend until now? The back and forth continued for a while, with Sarah insisting I should pay since I brought her. Eventually, Thomas got fed up before I did, saying if she didn't want to go home, it couldn't be helped. 
and he started the car. When Sarah asked how she was supposed to get back, Thomas said she'd be just fine. Maybe she'll just force herself into someone else's car? Thomas choked, still holding a grudge for her suddenly getting into our car before. Despite my repeated warnings that we'd leave her if she didn't come back, Sarah wouldn't listen. I felt bad about leaving her, but there was nothing more I could do after being pushed to this point. She'll figure something out, I thought, and we left the store. The next day I heard Sarah somehow got back by taking multiple buses. While Thomas laughed about her actually having her wallet, an angry Sarah showed up at our house looking furious. You left me and I couldn't even shop! That's terrible! It's your fault for not bringing any money to shop in the first place. Still, who leaves someone behind? You could have just paid! And let you skip out on paying, like always? You always say that! Mary, you're really stingy about money! She kept yelling her selfish arguments, angry that I didn't pay this time. She even demanded compensation for being hurt, causing a scene at the front door. What's going on? Why are you shouting? Oh, Jessica, listen! Mary was terrible to me! It was Jessica, a chatty mom friend who happened to pass by. Sarah, seeing her, smirked nastily probably planning to tell Jessica how awful I was and spread it around the neighborhood. Mary said she'd take me shopping, but then left me there. Oh, isn't that the story where you forced yourself into a promise? What? No, Mary said let's go. Who invites someone who always forgets their wallet and expects others to pay? Well, and then you tried to get someone to pay again and got left behind. That's what you deserve. Jessica, instead of spreading the rumor, pointed out the truth, leaving Sarah speechless. I had already talked to Jessica about what happened yesterday, pretending to seek advice, anticipating that Sarah would spread lies. After being scolded by Jessica, Sarah left with a red face. Jessica, saying it was a disaster, seemed a bit amused. She'd probably talk about Sarah's actions around the neighborhood. Following that, Sarah couldn't correct the story, and her misdeeds quickly spread, thanks to Jessica. Sarah tried to gain allies, but ended up spreading too much herself and didn't receive help from anyone. Instead, she was criticized and became more isolated in the neighborhood. It's all your fault! Even though I felt leaving her behind might have been too much, Sarah continued to blame me. She was scolded by her husband and started avoiding me. People who were tired of Sarah's behavior said I did well, so I hope this is settled now. Because of Sarah, I had been distant from others, but this incident helped me become friends with those I couldn't get close to before. We started going shopping together, of course paying for our own items. We've built a good, reciprocal relationship.